If you have your Bibles with you, I'd ask that you to turn to Hebrews, <laughs> Hebrews chapter 10. We're going to begin reading in verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 31. And uh, I did not mention, but y'all continue to remember Brother Clark as well. He's home and seemingly to be controlled on medicine with his heart, so y'all continue to remember him. Uh, Brother Trescott's surgery went well, so y'all pray for him as well. Hebrews chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 31. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, the Bible says, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion of me in my bonds, and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which you have great recompense of reward. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, ye might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come, and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But ye were not of them who draw back, unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Dear Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for uh, your Holy Spirit, Lord, that opens your word to us to more than just words on a page, but rather words spoken by you. God, we pray for the lost this morning, that you would save them, that you would touch their hearts, that you even just make them aware uh, of their sinful condition, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Now, I'll be preaching. We're going to go through the verses again, but I'll call your attention to the last of verse 39. Believe to the saving of the soul. Now, sometimes with Sovereign Grace churches, we forget the simplicity of the gospel. Believe and be saved. Uh, uh, repent uh, of your sin. And we leave that part out, and there's nothing wrong with preaching on the sovereignty of God, and it does prevent false professions, but the gospel is not complicated. The, the gospel is not diff difficult. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and ye shall be saved. Uh, Mark 16, 16. And we need to remember those things uh, as we share the gospel with others. Now, I'll call your attention to the church that's being written to, the very first Baptist church ever at Jerusalem. Uh, I believe the writer to be Paul because of the language, but it's never really said who wrote Hebrews, but uh, I believe it was Paul, and I believe the reason he didn't sign off on it is because he had great respect for the church of Jerusalem. Uh, he and Peter had some conflicts, but he respected Peter. And, and so I believe he didn't want to attach his name to it as though he thought he was better than those people. But he, he sent them some reminders, and if you know the history of the church at Jerusalem, they kind of got works back involved in that. Uh, they, they kind of kept a self-righteousness of the Jew. If you remember when the Bible says, uh, 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 Paul says of himself that I withstood Peter to his face. And the reason why is Peter was teaching you must be circumcised. And he was separating at a mealtime the Gentiles over here and uh, the Jews over here. And he says there is no separation. And so I believe the, the writer to be Paul, and he's reminding them of the simplicity of the salvation that comes from the Lord. Now, what I'll be preaching
searching on is saved from what? Now, living in the South, I thought everybody had heard of being saved. And when the Lord saved me as a 12-year-old boy, uh, I couldn't wait to get back to school uh, that fall and share with my friends that the Lord had saved me. And I remember telling a dear friend, and she's still a dear friend today, and there's no uh, need to make names, and her question to me, what does saved mean? And that amazed me. I, I had never even heard of it. You know, I, I, I thought everybody knew what that meant. Now, I responded by say, saying I've been saved from hell, which is very true. But there's a lot more to it Amen. than that. Amen. And the older I get, the more I see that, that uh, salvation does a lot more saving than simply uh, saving you from hell. So in 31, Paul reminds, or whomever the writer reminds them, uh, about how fearful it is to fall in the hands uh, of the Lord God Almighty, to you fall in the hands uh, of a God that is always living. In other words, uh, if you're not under the blood, he sees your sin. And he, he hates sin. Brother Jarrett mentioned that. And, and he, he despises it. And he has judgment for that. And he reminded the uh, Jerusalem believers, listen, it is a fearful thing to fall in, in, into the hands of God. Uh, I was witnessing to my cousin, and he ultimately committed suicide one day. And all his answer to me concerning the gospel, well, God is love, so he won't uh, send anyone to hell. So, so, so sad that, that so little understanding of the character of God. So little understanding of whom God really is. And as far as I know, Steve died in his sins and went out into a devil's hell. And that, that, that is very, very scary. Yeah. Uh, that uh, uh, after he died, Steve had killed himself. Mother said, well, uh, maybe he didn't kill himself. And I said, Mama, the, the, the gun was in his hand. <laughs> I, I think he killed himself. Because the way she believed is if you kill yourself, you're going to hell. Mm -hmm. The reason he went to hell had nothing to do with the way he died. The reason he went to hell is he didn't know the Lord Jesus Christ. That, that, that's what sent Steve to hell. And, and so we find so much muddled things in the modern day, uh, the, what, what salvation is and what salvation isn't, that... <coughs> Sometimes things to be need to be clarified. Verse 32, he says, But call to remembrance the former days, in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions. Now, one of the best things redeemed people, saved people you can do, remember when the Lord saved you. Remember the joy that brought in your life. Remember the newness of life that you experienced. They were having problems, so he says the best thing you can do is remember when the Lord saved you. And dear friend, if you can't remember when the Lord saved you, you're probably still lost. Uh, not knowing whether you're saved or not uh, is a very strange teaching. I know who mother and daddy was, right? I didn't question that. And so you know if you've been born again or not. Uh, yes, no, that's a yes, no question. And so uh, Paul says, you think about how good it was in the beginning. Verse 33, partly, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock, both uh, by reproaches and afflictions. Now, a gazing stock, and you know, uh, uh, my, my mother and my wife, when we were newly married, she's like, don't stare at people. And mama would slap me. And uh, that's a gazing stock. If you look or act different, people are going to look at you. They're going to be trying to figure you out. They're going to be trying to see what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's a sign of redemption. If you're different than this world, and you've become a gazing stock, and, and Paul or whomever, the writer, he wasn't upset about this. He, he, he said this is more 
more of a, of a merit badge. They, they looked at you and you were different because of redemption and, and it brought something out in you that in the end, most people, it's a good thing. It, it's, it's, it's a positive thing. And we live in a day and age today where everybody wants to fit in and everybody wants to look like everybody else and, and, and don't care. But don't, don't be upset if you don't look like this world. Don't be upset if you don't talk like this world. We're, we're to be a different people. The rest of verse 33, while as you became companions of them that were so used. Now he says you were strange, and many of you started hanging around strange people, <laughs> meaning the redeemed, meaning the elect. And Paul or whomever the writer was saying, that's a good thing. Do you, do you hang around the Lord's people or do you hang around the world? Now, this I know from, from 53 years of experience, if you hang around the world, you're going to start acting like them. And you're going to start doing like them. And it, it, listen, listen, it never, ever works the other way. If you're there to be a witness, share the gospel and leave. Because hanging out with them, listen, you're not going to overtake them. They're going to overtake you uh, every time. And, and so we see that as Paul is right, uh, the writer is writing, he reminds them how they impacted others. Some stared at them and some joined them. Verse 34, for ye had compassion on me and my bonds and took joyfully and the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that ye have in heaven a better and enduring substance. Now, he reminds them, listen, you helped me when nobody else would. Now, Paul was in prison, and listen, it wasn't three hots and a cot back then. If you got something to eat, it was because somebody brought it to you. If you had something to cover up with, it's because somebody brought it to you. And in the very same situation, he said, you provided my needs while I was in prison. You know, if you have a ministry like that, it's a joy to you. And if you let it go, it's a discouragement. And he says, just, just remember, remember how good that felt to be a minister unto one of the Lord's prophets, to, to one of the Lord's uh, apostles and <laughs> More or less, get out of the slump you're in. Verse 35. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence. Now, if you underline in your Bible, I, I want you to underline that because it says, cast not away your confidence. And, and the reason why we as good Baptists, we certainly understand it. No, we can't be unsaved once we are saved. But I want you to see it says we can cast off our confidence. How confident are you this morning that you are saved? Now, I'm certainly confident and glad and glorify God that very soon I hope I'll be at home with the Lord. But I've had in my life times when I wasn't nearly as confident. When I, my hair was down to my shoulders and I was listening to rock music and drinking and smoking pot, how could I possibly have any confidence? He says, don't give that up. Keep your confidence. How are you going to keep your confidence? If we can cast it away, certainly we should not be able to keep it, right? Stay with the Lord's people. Study that book in your lap. Keep coming to church. Those are the ways if you will, you'll keep the confidence. You won't cast it away. You'll certainly know. Somebody asks you, are you saved? You say, yes. Yes, I'm saved. Why? Because there's fruit, meat for repentance. 36. For ye have need of patience. Now, he wrote this to the church. He's fixing to talk about the second coming of Christ. And he says, your biggest problem, Jerusalem, is you need patience. Now, sadly, but true, I am not a very patient man. But you know what? <laughs> I've known I've known people that make me look like Job. 
You know what I'm saying? Just here and now or not at all. I want Jesus to come this very minute. It don't work that way. In fact, the Bible says Jesus don't even know. Yeah. It says the Father will tell him. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, uh, patience is a hard thing to get. The Bible is very clear on that. You know what brings patience experience? Lots of experiences. Lots of depending on others. Uh, how many of you ever asked your 15-year-old boy to take you to the store to get a Coke? When I had seizures every week, that was very, very humbling. Did either one of them ever say no? Of course not. They were glad to help me. But it brought patience. And all of you know how much I enjoy Don Dr. Peppers. I don't like waiting. But it brought me patience. Patience is a rough thing to gain. Waiting for Christ is difficult. But that is what we're given to do. He said, you know, don't, don't, don't be. <laughs> what you want to do is develop some patience in the waiting for the return of Christ. For you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, if you look at that through the eyes of man, you'd almost call it a lie, right? That book was written, now it's 21, I mean 2022, uh, almost 2,000 years ago. Yeah. That, that particular book was probably written about in the year 86, somewhere around in there. And uh, that's a whole lot of patience, is it not? A lot of people have been buried waiting on that blessed hope. Right? Yeah. And you know what? I've known many, many, many that were just sitting there waiting and being patient. We all want to go up in the cloud, do we not? I know I do. I've seen enough people die <laughs> that I know I know it's a scary thing. I do know that. Uh, I'm not scared of dying, but I'm scared how I'm gonna get there. You ever seen anybody die with cancer? It's the most horrible thing you'll ever see. They literally just waste away. They died waiting. They died with patience. And, and so sometimes the most difficult part of our life when illness comes and death is near, it's simply to grow our patience and see how much faith we really have. And yet a little while, he that shall tarry, Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ, shall, uh, shall come, will come, and not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. The saved, the redeemed, the just by law will wait in faith. <coughs> now, I don't know how your faith is this morning. Uh, I, I trust that I'm patient. You know, I, I want the Lord to come in my lifetime, but you know what? Just as easily, I may be pushing up daisies out there before, my, before Jesus comes. Does that mean he's not coming? No. What's the Bible consistent? Say, considering how the Lord God counts time. A day is unto a thousand years, and a thousand years is unto a day. Uh -huh. we, 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 like, we like to see the pedal spinning, don't we? You know, that means nothing to God. That, that device is something <laughs> that we created. I don't know when it'll come. But I do know this. My faith... <laughs> My faith tells me that it will come, and I'm anxiously waiting for the day. Verse, uh, uh, the rest of verse 38. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. You know people that say they were saved and just were seemingly on fire for the things of the Lord, 
and they last about as long as a June frost. That's these people. They're gone. They're done. And, and you know, uh, I have no confidence in whatsoever in a profession of faith that doesn't keep you in church. Me and Brother Junior were talking about how people, well, I can serve him just as well on the river. Most certainly you cannot. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. You know where you need to be on the Lord's day in the Lord's house. That's where you need to be. Yeah. And, and, and so we see then, as Paul is writing, he said, just because you say it, don't make it so. You know, back in the 90s, the big thing was name it and claim it. That puts you in the driver's seat, not the Almighty. That's foolishness, you know that? If I named a million dollars, I guarantee you I still wouldn't have had it today in the 90s, they're way gone. Right? And, and, and so we see then that uh, Paul said, gets down to the point there are some that say they're redeemed and that they are not. Verse 39, but we are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Simplicity of salvation. The saving of the soul. What are you saved from? What, what did he preserve you? What did he remove you from? Uh, let's think about Peter. And they were in the rowboat. They couldn't get to the other side. The Lord Jesus came walking on the sea. And he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid thou to come unto thee. <coughs> Jesus said, come. He got down in the boat, and he started walking. He started to sink. He said, Lord, save me. The Lord reached down and fixed him up, got him back in the ship. Now, I don't think that had anything to do with redemption, do you? I don't. What was the threat? To be saved, there has to be a threat, don't it? The threat was the storm. I think it was actually a wind. You know, it says it's stormy. It was the wind and the water. And boy, he was going down. That was the threat. Listen, people, uh, lost people, you're going down. You're going down spiritually. But there's an intervener. Christ simply said, Oh, thou little... What, what, what did we just say about faith? He said, Oh, thou of little faith. Concerning serving the Lord, not redemption, but concerning, concerning uh, serving the Lord, he said, If you had just the faith of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a wonderful thing to read, but kind of embarrassing if you read it in context, right? right. Mm -hmm. That's saying you don't even have this much. Right. And, and so we see, we see that to be saved, you have to have a threat. Now, I want you to go with me to Romans chapter 3, and Jared, uh, we, hopefully they'll forget before we get over there with you. But in Romans chapter 3, I'm going to show you something that you are saved from, and that is yourself. You're saved from yourself. Uh, Romans chapter 3, <coughs> excuse me, we're going to begin reading in verse 10. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, uh, the Bible says, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Now you think of all the people in the building this morning, and the Bible says there's not one of us righteous. You remember that. You know why you, even you that are redeemed, why you act like sinners sometimes, is because you are unrighteous. Without the merit of Christ, you'd still be on your way to hell. You would have no hope. You would be as good as already burning up. You would be in hell. There's none righteous. Now, the redeemed spirit man is righteous, but this flesh is still disgusting. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, that's why it's hard for us to serve. That's why when we come across a verse in the Bible that rubs you the wrong way and you don't want to do it, mm -hmm. that's this flesh. 
that that that's that's the uh, nature of this man that we're caught up in uh, for yet a little while. And so he, he makes it very clear. Then Paul writes, there is none that understandeth. Now, you think about when you were saved. I was saved as a 12-year-old boy. And I can't even remember the first time I was taken to church. I, I was just a boy. I, I mean, I'm sure I was an infant. I remember going to the church two times as a very young boy. And, but I think the reason I remembered, I got in trouble both times. Mama whipped me both times. One time I got in the coal bucket, and that did not go well. And the second time I fell in the spring, and that didn't go well either. And uh, uh, that, uh, but you know, I heard the gospel, and I heard the gospel, and I heard the gospel again, and it made no sense whatsoever. It, 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 it did not, it, it just wasn't even real. You know, people have a shame, uh, are ashamed to admit that today, but you know, to lost people, the gospel, the gospel don't even make sense. It, it, it isn't even anything real to them. So he says, there is none that understandeth. So you cannot do it with mankind's logic. It has to be a spiritual thing. You must be born again. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all going out of the way. Hard to, those sweet newborn babies, hard to believe that they're going out of the way, ain't it? Until you have one like Adam. And then you know that they're just as corrupt as the rest of us, right? Babies are sweet, but they're corrupt. And they show their nature probably more than any of us because they have no inhibitions. They haven't been whipped yet. <laughs> and, and so we find that that is our nature. So what are we going to be do about a nature that's so vile and so against God and in such a need of redemption. They are all going out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Even our prayers for the redeemed. <laughs> if, uh, if Christ didn't bring them before the throne, they'd be a stink in the nostrils of God. We're on the merit of Christ. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Their, with their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asp or snakes are under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. That is the condition of natural man. One day, I was figuring up at the curiosity. Of course, you know what they say about curiosity. But out of our 250 almost years as a nation and, and 25 will be 250 years old, uh, we've been at war for, I think, about 200 of them. Mm. You know why? Because mankind is depraved. That, that's our nature. We've been in 11 wars actively. You know why? Because we're depraved. You know, we need to, if you could ever, if you've ever could spiritually understand your nature, you would cry out to God. <laughs> you know, of the two love, the first one, total depravity. If you don't ever believe that, you'll never cry out to God. Yeah. You really won't. My, that, that's an assurance. And you know why? Because you think yourself is okay. You, you think yourself is sufficient. You know where works for salvation comes? It's from, from people believing that they're not totally depraved. So that's exactly where it comes. And, and, and so we see that as Paul is writing to the church at Rome, he describes man to the T. Now we, verse 19, now we know what things soever the law saith, it saith to them that are under the law, and that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may come, become guilty before God. 
You're saved from the law. You're saved from yourself. This, uh, this flesh is, is more than disgusting. You look all around us. Why is gender become fluent or changing? Like one day I can wake up, oh gee, I think I'll be a woman today. I don't think I'm gonna be either. I think I'll be a guy today. Where did that come from? The depravity of man. Look at Sodom and Gomorrah. That's not brand new thought, people. It's as old as time itself. Man is depraved. He saves us from our own selves. That's one thing he saves us for. He saves us from our own selves. Because if not, we would, we would be totally helpless and with, with nothing, nothing whatsoever to hope for. Now go with me to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. We're going to begin reading in verse 6 for time's sake. Another key to salvation, another thing uh, that he saves us from. Likewise, uh, excuse me, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Now, only the redeemed can do that truly. Only the redeemed can accomplish this. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, I want you to notice two things. Uh, first of all, we're not always humbled under the hand of the Almighty because sometimes his will and what we want to do is contrary one to the others, how the Scripture puts it. And, and so sometimes when he says stay and you want to go, what are you going to do? Yeah. When he says you give that last $2 to the church for so-and-so missionary, and you know there's no more milk in the fridge, what are you going to do? You see what I'm saying? It's good until it's contrary to what we want, what we desire, what we think is best. And, and then it's quite difficult. So as Peter is writing to the churches in general, so that means this was a general problem in many of them, <coughs> humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Now, that exalting is not the exalting of the flesh, but the exalting of the spirit man. When, when this flesh is put aside and we stand in glory, we will be exalted. We will be lifted up. And, and not, not unto ourselves, it will be unto the merit of Christ. You know why he saved you? He didn't save you to avoid hell. He saved you to glorify him his own self. Yeah. So you look at this disgusting, filthy creature that I made a pleasing vessel. <laughs> and the Father says, man, that's good. <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> that's, the, it brings glory to God, not you. And, and so we see that as Peter's writing, he, uh, he reminds them of being obedient to the will of God. Verse 7. Casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Easy to read, hard to do. Verse 8. Be sober. Be serious. That, that be sober don't, don't mean don't get drunk. It means be serious. How, how seriously, how serious do you take the times that we live in? Listen, there are some troublesome times. And sometimes I choose to ignore them. I don't have a regular TV, so sometimes catching the news uh, is difficult. I see a little bit on Facebook. But man, we're in, we're in a bad way. America's going down the tubes. Yeah. Morality has hit a rock bottom. Sarah told me 
in school, that she's in a speech contest, I mean a speech class. And there's a woman going to give a, uh, a speech on this topic. I guess it's really not important, but basically the lack of communication between people today. And that's looked as erroneous. You know, people like that, the only thing I have to offer them is gospel. What do they want me to do? Validate them? What, what do they want me to do? Say that it's okay? I, I, can't, I, I can't go against my God. So the only thing I have to share with them with as much compassion as I can is the Lord Jesus saves. That's, a, that's all I can offer them. And, and, and so we find we live in a very, uh, a very mixed up and, 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 and sinful, horrible day, but Jesus still saves. Now, verse, two, uh, verse 8, be vigilant, be sober, be vigilant. Vigilant is paying attention to detail. Vigilant is keeping the light on. Vigilant is inspecting. Somebody comes in, look them over. If somebody comes to your door, uh, you know, I, I personally think door to door ministry is about over because you knock on the door and they won't come to the door. But, uh, you know, the Russellite Jehovah's Witness used to have its beat on that. Uh, but they don't even do it anymore. Have you noticed that? Uh, we live in a different day. Watch people you come in contact with any way that you come in contact with them. Be vigilant. Don't mean you have to be mean to them, but you know what? If they look like the world, act like the world, and do like the world, they're probably the world. You don't take a rocket scientist to figure that one out, does it? Attention to detail. Uh, who are you going to let into your life, and who are you going to just be uh, friendly to and move on? Be sober, be vigilant. This is the reason, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, think about it, church. Whom is he writing to? Every church that we know of at that time. It is a general epistle. It went to a lot of people. So he, he wanted to remind everybody, hey, the devil's out there. The devil's doing things. The devil, the devil, the devil's against you. He's against your church. He's against your family. But you know what? On the merit of Christ, he saved us from that. He saved us from the devil. He, he, he saved us from fully being overtaken by that. Yeah. That, that's, what, that's one of the many, many things he saved us from. He, he is sufficient. Uh, now don't get me wrong, the devil's going to come your way. But if you stay in the will of God, it won't take him long. What, what's the Bible say? I think it's in 2 Peter. Resist the devil. Maybe it's in James. Resist the devil and, and he will flee from you. Resist him. And that comes by, by, by the Lord saving us. Last place I want to read, uh, very familiar verses of Scripture, the Gospel of Luke. Luke 16. Luke 16 and verse 22. The Bible says, And it came to pass that the beggar died. That's coming to every one of us. One day, y'all gonna look up. Y'all gonna open up. Uh, we can't say the times anymore because Stuart County, Houston County Times is no more. They issued their last issue, but I forgot what Danny Pepper's paper's name is. Something uh, Stuart County Standard. And uh, one day, if the Lord don't come, right there in the obit section, Larry Lyle. Age 105. No. <laughs> uh, it's going to be there. And other people are going to be reading it and say, I knew that fella. It's, it's coming. Came to the rich man, came to the poor man equally, didn't it? 
just because he was poor and pitiful and bold Christ, <laughs> it didn't get, it didn't give him any extra years, did it? He died too. Was he a good man? You betcha he was a good man. And and he and he honored God, but at the very same time, he died too. This is coming. Lots of people listen to me. You will die. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by angels into Abraham's bosom. And the rich man also died and was buried. And he, and in hell, meaning the rich man, he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, plural, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Yeah. Now, I want you to see, first of all, in the modern day, what they're taking away from hell is a burning real hell. Yeah. Uh, lots of people I'm telling you, it's a burning real hell. It hurts terribly. Have you ever burned yourself? I have. Donna burned herself at least twice a year. Cook it. And uh, uh, Matthew one time caught a shirt on fire. That was a mess. Mm. Then he said, Daddy, I was so scared. I'm sure it was. I never had my clothes on fire that I, I remember anyway. How you gonna get away from it? You'll never get away from the fires of hell. Once you're there, you're there. That's it. You got it. That's eternity. Mm -hmm. And so we find that the rich man was hurting, he was in pain, but everything up here was still intact. Now, I, I've seen a lot of people in misery from different diseases, but they were so confused, they weren't experiencing pain like you and I do. Were they hurting? Sure. Were they hurting as bad? Probably not. They, they didn't perceive it. You know what? Your intellect will be perfectly intact. You will remember every sermon you ever heard. You will remember every warning that was given. It will be intact. But I want you to see, despite all this, the nature of the rich man was not changed. Hell does not change uh, uh, the law. So hell punishes the laws. It doesn't change them. You know what he saw? He still saw Lazarus as a, as a filthy bomb that could serve him. He said, some Lazarus over here and bring me a little water. Mm. His nature had not changed. Hell doesn't change your nature. <laughs> it, it, if anything, you hate God more. <laughs> and, and, and so we see that you know the rest of the story. It is there in hell. And Abraham says, you can't get out. There's a great gulf fixed between us. And he says, if that's not true, he said, or if he said, if that's true, go tell my brethren. For I do not want them to come to this place. You know what? Lost people, it's too late to get mission-minded when you're in hell. You need to be saved. The very last thing that we know from that text, Abraham says, though one would come from the dead, they will not believe. Yeah. And you know what? One did come from the dead. The Lord Jesus Christ, he's our redeemer, he's our savior. And there are hundreds upon millions today that do not believe. Have you really been saved? Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ? You live here 105 years. It's only thing that really matters, is it not? 